Chapter Twenty Six of Esther Waters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. Esther Waters by George Moore. Chapter Twenty Six. William was waiting for her in the area, and while pinning on her hat, she thought of what she should say and how she should act. Should she tell him that she wanted to marry Fred? Then the long black pin that was to hold her hat to her hair went through the straw with a little sharp sound, and she decided that when the time came she would know what to say. As he stepped aside to let her go up the area steps, she noticed how beautifully dressed he was. He wore a pair of gray trousers, and in his spick and span morning coat there was a bunch of carnations. They walked some half dozen yards up the street in silence. But why do you want to see the boy? You never thought of him all these years. I'll tell you, Esther. But it is nice to be walking out with you again. If you'd only let bygones be bygones, we might settle down together yet. What do you think? She did not answer, and he continued. It do seem strange to be walking out with you again, meeting you after all these years, and I'm never in your neighborhood. I just happened to have a bit of business with a friend who lives your way, and was coming along from his house, turning over in my mind what he had told me about rising sun for the steward's cup. When I saw you coming along with the jug in your hand, I said, "That's the prettiest girl I've seen this many a day. That's the sort of girl I'd like to see behind the bar of the king's head." You always keeps your figure. You know you ain't changed a bit. And when I caught sight of those white teeth, I said, "Lor, why it's Esther." I thought it was about the child you was going to speak to me. So I am, but you came first in my estimation. The moment I looked into your eyes, I felt it had been a mistake all along, and that you was the only one I had cared about. Then all about wanting to see the child was a pack of lies. No, they weren't lies. I wanted both mother and child, if I could get 'em, you know. I'm telling you the unvarnished truth, Esther. I thought of the child as a way of getting you back. But little by little, I began to take an interest in him, to wonder what he was like, and with thoughts of the boy came different thoughts of you, Esther, who was the mother of my boy. Then I wanted you both back, and I've thought of nothing else ever since. At that moment, they reached the Metropolitan Railway, and William pressed forward to get the tickets. A subterraneous rumbling was heard, and they ran down the steps as fast as they could. And seeing them so near, the ticket collector held the door open for them. And just as the train was moving from the platform, William pushed Esther into a second-class compartment. "We're in the wrong class!" she cried. "No, we ain't. Get in, get in!" he shouted. And with the guard crying to him to desist, he hopped in after her, saying, "You very nearly made me miss the train. What did you have done if the train had taken you away and left me behind?" The remark was not altogether a happy one. "Then you travel second class," Esther said. Yes, I always travel second class now. Peggy never would, but second seems to me quite good enough. I don't care about third unless one is with a lot of pals and can keep the carriage to ourselves. That's the way we manage it when we go down to Newmarket or Doncaster. They were alone in the compartment. William leaned forward and took her hand. Tried to forgive me, Esther. She drew her hand away. He got up and sat down beside her and put his arm around her waist. No, no, I'll have none of that. All that sort of thing is over between us. He looked at her inquisitively, not knowing how to act. I know you've had a hard time, Esther. Tell me about it. What did you do when you left Woodview? He unfortunately added, "Did you ever meet any one since that you cared for?" The question irritated her, and she said, "It don't matter to you who I met or what I went through." The conversation paused. William spoke about the Barfields, and Esther could not but listen to the tale of what had happened at Woodview during the last eight years. Woodview had been all her unhappiness and all her misfortune. She had gone there when the sap of life was flowing fastest in her, and Woodview had become the most precise and distinct vision she had gathered from life. She remembered that wholesome and ample country house with its park and its downlands and the valley farm, sheltered by the long lines of elms. She remembered the racehorses, their slight forms showing under the gray clothing, the round black eyes looking out through the eyelet holes in the hanging hoods, the odd little boys astride, a string of six or seven passing always before the kitchen windows, going through the paddock gate under the bunched evergreens. She remembered the rejoicings when the horse won at Goodwood, 
and the ball at the Shoreham Gardens. Woodview had meant too much in her life to be forgotten. Its hillside and its people were drawn out in sharp outline in her mind. Something in William's voice recalled her from her reverie, and she heard him say, "'The poor gaffer. He never got over it. It regular broke him up. I forgot to tell you, it was Ginger who was riding. It appears that he did all he knew. He lost start. He tried to get shut in. But it weren't no go. Luck was against them. The orse was full of running. And, of course, he couldn't sit down and saw his blooming head off, right in the middle of the course, with Sir Thomas—that's the handicapper field glasses on him. He'd have been warned off the blooming eath, and he couldn't afford that, even to save his own father. The oars won in a canter. They clapped eight stun on him for the Cambridgeshire. It broke the gaffer's art. He had to sell off his horses, and he died soon after the sale. He died of consumption. It generally takes them off earlier, but they say it is in the family. Miss Mary— "'Oh, tell me about her,' said Esther, who had been thinking all the while of Mrs. Barfield and Miss Mary. "'Tell me, there's nothing the matter with Miss Mary.' "'Yes, there is. She can't live no more in England. She has to go to winter, I think it is, in Algeria.' At that moment the train screeched along the rails, and vibrating under the force of the brakes, it passed out of the tunnel into Blackfriars. "'We shall just be able to catch the ten minute past four to Peckham,' she said, and they ran up the high steps. William strode along so fast that Esther was obliged to cry out. "'There's no use, William. Train or no train. I can't walk at that rate.' There was just time for them to get their tickets at Ludgate Hill. They were in a carriage by themselves, and he proposed to drop the windows, so that they might be able to talk more easily. He was interested in the ill luck that had attended certain horses, and Esther wanted to hear about Mrs. Barfield. "'You seem to be very fond of her. What did she do for you?' "'Everything. That was after you went away. She was kind.' "'I'm glad to hear that,' said William. "'So they spends the summer at Woodview, and goes to foreign parts for the winter?' "'Yes, that's it. Most of the estate was sold. But Mrs. Barfield, the saint—you remember we used to call her the saint—well, she has her fortune, about five hundred a year, and they just manage to live there in a sort of hole-and-corner sort of way. They can't afford to keep a trap, and towards the end of October they go off— and don't return till the beginning of May. Woodview ain't what it was. You remember the stables that were being put up when Silverbraid won the two cups? Well, they are just as when you last saw them, rafters and walls. Racing don't seem to bring no luck to any one. It ain't my affair, but if I was you I'd give it up and get to some honest work. Racing has been a good friend to me. I don't know where I should be without it to-day. So all the servants have left Woodview? I wonder what has become of them. You remember my mother, the cook? She died a couple of years ago. Mrs. Latch? Oh, I'm so sorry. She was an old woman. You remember Jack Randall, the butler? He's in a situation in Cumberland Place, near the Marble Arch. He sometimes comes round, and has a glass in the king's head. Sarah Tucker. She's in a situation somewhere in town. I don't know what has become of Margaret Gale. I met her one day in the Strand. I'd had nothing to eat all day. I was almost fainting, and she took me into a public-house, and gave me a sausage. The train began to slacken speed, and William said, "'This is Peckham.' They handed up their tickets, and passed into the air of an irregular little street, low disjointed shops and houses, where tram-cars tinkled through a slacker tide of humanity than the Londoners were accustomed to. "'This way,' said Esther, "'this is the way to the Rye.' "'Then Jackie lives at the Rye?' "'Not far from the Rye. Do you know East Dulwich?' "'No, I never was here before. "'Mrs. Lewis, that's the woman who looks after him, "'lives at East Dulwich, but it ain't very far. "'I always gets out here. "'I suppose you don't mind a quarter of an hour's walk.' "'Not when I'm with you,' William replied gallantly, "'and he followed her through the passers-by. "'The rye opened up like a large park, "'beginning in the town and wending far away into a country prospect. "'At the Peckham end there were a dozen handsome trees.' and under them a piece of artificial water, where boys were sailing toy boats, and a poodle was swimming. Two old ladies in black came out of a garden full of hollyhocks. They walked towards a seat and sat down in the autumn landscape. And as William and Esther pursued their way, the rye seemed to grow longer and longer. It opened up into a vast expanse, full of the last days of cricket. It was charming with slender trees, and a Japanese pavilion quaintly placed on a little mound. 
an upland background in gradations, interspaced with villas, terraces, and gardens, and steep hillside, showing fields and hayricks, brought the ride to a picturesque and abrupt end. But it ain't nearly so big as Chester Racecourse. A regular cockpit of a place is the Chester Course, and not every horse can get round it. Turning to the right, and leaving the ride behind them, they ascended a long, monotonous, and very ugly road, composed of artificial little houses, each set in a portion of a very metallic garden. These continued all the way to the top of a long hill, straggling into a piece of waste ground, where there were some trees and a few rough cottages. A little boy came running towards them, stumbling over the cinder heaps, and the tin canisters with which the place was strewn, and William felt that the child was his. "'That child will break his blooming little neck if he don't take care,' he remarked tentatively. She hated him to see the child, and to assert her complete ownership, she clasped Jackie to her bosom without a word of explanation, and she questioned the child on matters about which William knew nothing. William stood looking tenderly on his son, waiting for Esther to introduce them. Mother and child were both so glad in each other that they forgot the fine gentleman standing by. Suddenly, the boy looked towards his father, and she repented a little of her cruelty. "'Jackie,' she said, "'do you know who this gentleman is who has come to see you?' "'No, I don't.' She did not care that Jackie should love his father, and yet she could not help feeling sorry for William. "'I'm your father,' said William. "'No, you ain't. I ain't got no father.' "'How do you know, Jackie?' "'Father died before I was born. Mother told me.' "'But mother may be mistaken.' If my father hadn't died before I was born, he'd have been to see us before this. Come, mother, come to tea. Mrs. Lewis has got hot cakes, and they'll be burnt if we stand talking. Yes, dear, but what the gentleman says is quite true. He is your father. Jackie made no answer, and Esther said, I told you your father was dead, but I was mistaken. Won't you come and walk with me? said William. No, thank you. I like to walk with mother. "'He's always like that with strangers,' said Esther. "'It is shyness. "'But he'll come and talk to you presently, if you leave him alone.' Each cottage had a rough piece of garden. The yellow crowns of sunflowers showed over the broken palings, and Mrs. Lewis's large face came into the window-pane. A moment later she was at the front door, welcoming her visitors. The affection of her welcome was checked when she saw that William was with Esther, and she drew aside respectfully to let this fine gentleman pass. When they were in the kitchen, Esther said, "'This is Jackie's father.' "'What? Never. I thought. But I'm sure we're very glad to see you.' Then, noticing the fine gold chain that hung across his waistcoat, the cut of his clothes, and the air of money which his whole bearing seemed to represent, she became a little obsequious in her welcome. "'I'm sure, sir, we're very glad to see you. Won't you sit down?' And dusting a chair with her apron, she handed it to him. Then, turning to Esther, she said, "'Sit yourself down, dear.' "'Tea'll be ready in a moment.' She was one of those women who, although their apron-strings are a good yard in length, preserve a strange agility of movement and a pleasant vivacity of speech. "'I hope, sir, we've brought him up to your satisfaction. We've done the best we could. He's a dear boy. There's been a bit of jealousy between us on his account. But for all that, we haven't spoiled him. I don't want to praise him, but he is as well-behaved a boy as I knows of. Maybe a bit willful, but there ain't much fault to find with him and I ought to know, for it is I that had the bringing up of him since he was a baby of two months old. Jackie, dear, why don't you go to your father? He stood by his mother's chair, twisting his slight legs in a manner that was peculiar to him. His dark hair fell in thick, heavy locks over his small face, and from under the shadow of his locks his great luminous eyes glanced furtively at his father. Mrs. Lewis told him to take his finger out of his mouth, and thus encouraged he went towards William still twisting his legs, and looking curiously dejected. He did not speak for some time, but he allowed William to put his arm round him, and draw him against his knees. Then fixing his eyes on the toes of his shoes, he said somewhat abruptly, but confidentially, "'Are you really my father? No humbug, you know?' he added, raising his eyes, and for a moment looking William searchingly in the face. "'I'm not humbugging, Jack. I'm your father right enough. Don't you like me?' "'But I think you said you didn't want to have a father.' Jackie did not answer this question. After a moment's reflection, he said, "'If you be my father, why didn't you come to see us before?' William glanced at Esther, who in her turn glanced at Mrs. Lewis. "'I'm afraid that's a rather long story, Jackie. 
I was away in foreign parts. Jackie looked as if he would like to hear about foreign parts, and William awaited the question that seemed to tremble on the child's lips. But instead, he turned suddenly to Mrs. Lewis, and said, "'The cakes aren't burnt, are they? I ran as fast as I could the moment I saw them coming.' The childish abruptness of the transition made them laugh, and an unpleasant moment passed away. Mrs. Lewis took the plate of cakes from the fender and poured out their tea. The door and window were open, and the dying light lent a tenderness to the tea-table, to the quiet solicitude of the mother watching her son, knowing him in all his intimate habits, to the eager curiosity of the father on the other side, leaning forward, delighted at every look and word, thinking it all astonishing, wonderful. Jackie sat between the women. He seemed to understand that his chance of eating as many tea-cakes as he pleased had come, and he ate with his eyes fixed on the plate, considering which piece he would have when he had finished the piece he had in his hand. Little was said, a few remarks about the fine weather, and offers to put out another cup of tea. By their silence, Mrs. Lewis began to understand that they had differences to settle, and that she had better leave them. She took her shawl from the peg, and pleaded that she had an appointment with a neighbor. But she wouldn't be more than half an hour. Would they look after the house till her return? And William watched her, thinking of what he would say when she was out of hearing. That little boy of ours is a dear little fellow. You've been a good mother, I can see that. If I had only known. There's no use talking no more about it. What's done is done. The cottage door was open, and in the still evening they could see their child swinging on the gate. The moment was tremulous with responsibility, and yet the words, as they fell from their lips, seemed accidental. At last he said, Esther, I can get a divorce. You'd much better go back to your wife. Once married, always married. That's my way of thinking. I'm sorry to hear you say it, Esther. Do you think a man should stop with his wife, who's been treated as I have been? Esther avoided a direct reply. Why should he care about the child? He had never done anything for him. William said that if he had known there was a child, he would have left his wife long ago. He believed that he loved the child just as much as she did, and didn't believe in marriage without children. That would have been very wrong. We ain't getting no forwarder by discussing them things, he said, interrupting her. We can't say good-bye after this evening and never see one another again. Why not? I'm nothing to you now. You've got a wife of your own. You've no claim upon me. You can go your way, and I can keep to mine. There's that child. I must do something for him. Well, you can do something for him without ruining me. Ruining you, Esther? Yes, ruining me. I ain't going to lose my character by keeping company with a married man. You've done me harm enough already, and should be ashamed to think of doing me any more. You can pay for the boy's schooling, if you like. You can pay for his keep, too. But you mustn't think that in doing so you'll get hold of me again. Do you mean it, Esther? Followers ain't allowed where I am. You're a married man. I won't have it. But when I get my divorce? When you get your divorce? I don't know how it'll be, then. But here's Mrs. Lewis. She's a scolding of Jackie for swinging on that air gate. Naughty boy. He's been told twenty times not to swing on the gate. Esther complained that they had stayed too long, that he had made her late, and treated his questions about Jackie with indifference. He might write if he had anything important to say, but she could not keep company with a married man. William seemed very downcast. Esther, too, was unhappy, and she did not know why. She had succeeded as well as she had expected, but success had not brought that sense of satisfaction which she had expected it would. Her idea had been to keep William out of the way, and hurry on her marriage with Fred. But this marriage, once so ardently desired, no longer gave her any pleasure. She had told Fred about the child. He had forgiven her. But now she remembered that men were very forgiving before marriage. And how did she know that he would not reproach her with the fault the first time they came to disagree about anything? Ah, it was all misfortune. She had no luck. She didn't want to marry anyone. That visit to Dulwich had thoroughly upset her. She ought to have kept out of William's way. That man seemed to have a power over her, and she hated him for it. What did he want to see the child for? The child was nothing to him. She had been a fool. Now he'd be after the child. And through this fever of trouble there raged an acute desire to know what Jackie thought of his father, what Mrs. Lewis thought of William. And the desire to know what was happening became intolerable. She went to her mistress to ask for leave to go out. Very little of her agitation betrayed itself in her demeanor, but Miss Rice's sharp eyes had guessed that her servant's life was at a crisis. 
She laid her book on her knee, asked a few kind, discreet questions, and after dinner Esther hurried towards the underground. The door of the cottage was open, and as she crossed the little garden, she heard Mrs. Lewis say, "'Now you must be a good boy, and not go out into the garden and spoil your new clothes.' And when Esther entered, Mrs. Lewis was giving the finishing touches to the necktie, which she had just tied. "'Now you'll go and sit on that chair like a good boy, and wait there till your father comes.' "'Oh, here's Mummy!' cried the boy, and he darted out of Mrs. Lewis's hand. "'Look at my new clothes, Mummy, look at them!' And Esther saw her boy dressed in a suit of velveteen knickerbockers with brass buttons, and a sky-blue necktie. His father, I mean Mr. Latch, came here on Thursday morning, and took him to—took to, took me up to London, and brought him back in those clothes. We went to such a big shop in Oxford Street for them, and they took down many suits before they could get one to fit. Father is that difficult to please, and I thought we should go away without any clothes, and I couldn't walk about London with father in these old things. Ain't they shabby? he added, kicking them contemptuously. It was a little gray suit that Esther had made for him with her own hands. Father had me measured for another suit, but it won't be ready for a few days. Father took me to the zoological gardens, and we saw the lions and tigers, and there are such a lot of monkeys. There is one— "'But what makes you look so cross, Mummy dear? Don't you ever go out with father in London? London is such a beautiful place. And then we walked through the park, and saw a lot of boys sailing boats. Father asked me if I had a boat. I said you couldn't afford to buy me toys. He said that was hard lines on me, and on the way back to the station we stopped at a toy shop, and he bought me a boat. May I show you my boat?' Jackie was too much occupied with thoughts of his boat to notice the gloom that was gathering on his mother's face. Mrs. Lewis wished to call upon him to desist, but before she could make up her mind what to do, he had brought the toy from the table, and was forcing it into his mother's hands. "'This is a cutter-rigged boat, because it has three sails, and only one mast. Father told me it was. He'll be here in half an hour. We're going to sail the boat in the pond on the rye. And if it gets across all right, he'll take me to the park, where there's a big piece of water, twice, three times as big as the water on the rye.' "'Do you think, Mummy, that I shall ever be able to get my boat across such a piece of water as the—' "'I've forgotten the name. What do they call it, Mummy? "'Oh, I don't know. Don't bother me with your boat. "'Oh, Mummy, what have I done that you won't look at my boat? "'Aren't you coming with Father to the Rye to see me sail it?' "'I don't want to go with you. You want me no more. I can't afford to give you boats. "'Come, don't plague me any more with your toy,' she said, pushing it away. And then, in a moment of convulsive passion, she threw the boat across the room. It struck the opposite wall. Its mast was broken, and the sails and cords made a tangled little heap. Jackie ran to his toy. He picked it up, and his face showed his grief. "'I shan't be able to sail my boat now. It won't sail. Its mast and the sails is broke. Mummy, what did you break my boat for?' And the child burst into tears. At that moment William entered. "'What is the child crying for?' he asked, stopping abruptly on the threshold. There was a slight tone of authority in his voice, which angered Esther still more. "'What is it to you what he is crying for?' she said, turning quickly round. "'What has the child got to do with you that you should come down ordering people about for? A nice sort of mean trick, and one that is just like you. You beg and pray of me to let you see the child, and when I do, you come down here on the sly, and with the present of a suit of clothes and a toy boat, you try to win his love away from his mother.' "'Esther, Esther, I never thought of getting his love from you. I meant no harm. Mrs. Lewis said that he was looking a trifle moped, and we thought a change would do him good, and so. Ah, it was Mrs. Lewis that asked you to take him up to London. It is a strange thing what a little money will do. Ever since you set foot in this cottage, she has been curtsying to you, handing you chairs. I didn't much like it, but I didn't think that she would round on me in this way. Then turning suddenly on her old friend, she said, who told you to let him have the child? Is it he or I who pays you for his keep? Answer me this. How much did he give you? A new dress? Oh, Esther, I am surprised at you. I didn't think it would come to accusing me of being bribed. And after all these years, Mrs. Lewis put her apron to her eyes, and Jackie stole over to his father. It wasn't I who smashed the boat. It was Mummy. She's in a passion. I don't know why she smashed it. I didn't do nothing. William took the child on his knee. She didn't mean to smash it. There's a good boy. Don't cry no more. Jackie looked at his father. Will you buy me another? The shops aren't open today. 
Then getting off his father's knee, he picked up the toy, and coming back, he said, "'Could we mend the boat somehow? Do you think we could?' "'Jackie, dear, go away. Leave your father alone. Go into the next room,' said Mrs. Lewis. "'No, he can stop here. Let him be,' said Esther. "'I want to have no more to say to him. He can look to his father for the future.' Esther turned on her heel and walked straight for the door. But dropping his boat with a cry, the little fellow ran after her and clung to her skirt despairingly. "'No, Mummy dear, you mustn't go. Never mind the boat. I love you better than the boat. I'll do without a boat.' "'Esther, Esther, this is all nonsense. Just listen.' "'No, I won't listen to you. But you shall listen to me. When I brought you here last week, you asked me in the train what I'd been doing all these years. I didn't answer you, but I will now. I've been in the workhouse.' "'In the workhouse?' "'Yes, do that surprise you?' Then jerking out her words, throwing them at him as if they were half-bricks, she told him the story of the last eight years. Queen Charlotte's Hospital, Mrs. Rivers, Mrs. Spires, the night on the embankment, and the workhouse. And when I came out of the workhouse, I travelled London in search of sixteen pounds a year wages, which was the least I could do with. And when I couldn't find them, I sat here and ate dry bread. She'll tell you. She saw it all. I haven't said nothing about the shame and sneers that I had to put up with. You would understand nothing about that. And there was more than one situation I was thrown out of when they found I had a child, for they didn't like loose women in their houses. I had them very words said about me. And while I was going through all that, you was living in riches with a lady in foreign parts. And now, when she could put up with you no longer, and you're kicked out, you come to me and ask for your share of the child. Share of the child. What share is yours, I'd like to know. Esther, in your mean, underhand way, you come here on the sly to see if you can't steal the love of the child from me. She could speak no more. Her strength was giving way before the tumult of her passion, and the silence that had come suddenly into the room was more terrible than her violent words. William stood quaking, horrified, wishing the earth would swallow him. Mrs. Lewis watched Esther's pale face, fearing that she would faint. Jackie, his grey eyes open round, held his broken boat still in his hand. The sense of the scene had hardly caught on his childish brain. He was very frightened. His tears and sobs were a welcome intervention. Mrs. Lewis took him in her arms and tried to soothe him. William tried to speak. His lips moved, but no words came. Mrs. Lewis whispered, "'You'll get no good out of her now. Her temper's up. You'd better go. She don't know what she's a-saying of.' "'If one of us has to go,' said William, taking the hint, "'there can't be much doubt which of us.' He stood at the door, holding his hat, just as if he were going to put it on. Esther stood with her back turned to him. At last he said, "'Good-bye, Jackie. I suppose you don't want to see me again.' For reply, Jackie threw his boat away, and clung to Mrs. Lewis for protection. William's face showed that he was pained by Jackie's refusal. "'Try to get your mother to forgive me. But you are right to love her best.' She's been a good mother to you. He put on his hat, and went without another word. No one spoke, and every moment the silence grew more paralyzing. Jackie examined his broken boat for a moment, and then he put it away, as if it had ceased to have any interest for him. There was no chance of going to the rye that day. He might as well take off his velvet suit. Besides, his mother liked him better in his old clothes. When he returned, his mother was sorry for having broken his boat, and appreciated the cruelty— "'You shall have another boat, my darling,' she said, leaning across the table, and looking at him affectionately. "'And quite as good as the one I broke. "'Will you, Mummy? One with three sails, cutter-rigged like that?' "'Yes, dear, you shall have a boat with three sails. "'When will you buy me the boat, Mummy? Tomorrow?' "'As soon as I can, Jackie.' This promise appeared to satisfy him. Suddenly he looked. "'Is Father coming back no more?' "'Do you want him back?' Jackie hesitated. His mother pressed him for an answer. "'Not if you don't, Mummy. "'But if he was to give you another boat, one with four sails? "'They don't have four sails, not them with one mast. "'If he was to give you a boat with two masts, would you take it? "'I should try not to. I should try ever so hard.' "'There were tears in Jackie's voice, and then, as if doubtful of his power to resist temptation, "'he buried his face in his mother's bosom and sobbed bitterly. "'You shall have another boat, my darling. "'I don't want no boat at all.' I love you better than a boat, Mummy. Indeed I do. And what about those clothes? You'd sooner stop with me and wear those shabby clothes than go to him and wear a pretty velvet suit? You can send back the velvet suit. Can I? My darling, Mummy will give you another velvet suit. 
and she embraced the child with all her strength, and covered him with kisses. "'But why can't I wear the velvet suit? And why can't father come back? Why don't you like father? You shouldn't be cross with father because he gave me the boat. He didn't mean no harm. I think you like your father. You like him better than me. Not better than you, mummy. You wouldn't like to have any other father except your own real father? How could I have a father that wasn't my own real father? Esther did not press the point, and soon after Jackie began to talk about the possibility of mending his boat, and feeling that something irrevocable had happened, Esther put on her hat and jacket, and Mrs. Lewis and Jackie accompanied her to the station. The women kissed each other on the platform, and were reconciled, but there was a vague sensation of sadness in the leave-taking, which they did not understand and Esther sat alone in a third-class carriage, absorbed in consideration of the problem of her life. The life she had dreamed would never be hers. Somehow she seemed to know that she would never be Fred's wife. Everything seemed to point to the inevitableness of this end. She had determined to see William no more, but he wrote asking how she would like him to contribute towards the maintenance of the child, and this could not be settled without personal interviews. Miss Rice and Mrs. Lewis seemed to take it for granted that she would marry William when he obtained his divorce. He was applying himself to the solution of this difficulty, and professed himself to be perfectly satisfied with the course that events were taking. And whenever she saw Jackie, he inquired after his father. He hoped, too, that she had forgiven poor father, who had never meant no harm at all. Day by day she saw more clearly that her instinct was right in warning her not to let the child see William that she had done wrong, in allowing her feelings to be overruled by Miss Rice, who had, of course, advised her for the best. But it was clear to her now that Jackie never would take kindly to Fred as a stepfather, that he would never forgive her if she divided him from his real father by marrying another man. He would grow to dislike his stepfather more and more, and when he grew older he would keep away from the house on account of the presence of his stepfather. It would end by his going to live with him, he would be led into a life of betting and drinking. She would lose her child if she married Fred. End of chapter 26